Good morning, guys. Ooh, excuse me. The on rider. How does the video started? Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? The debate on the rapture is rising up again. I'm starting to see more videos, new videos popping up of people going, getting back into that argument. And I'm listening to them, and I'm listening to what they're using for justification, and it's like, I get it. If you take those scriptures that you're sharing into account, I had this conversation with someone about uh, last year. I told him I, I understand it, the scriptures you presented show a mid-trib rapture, post-trib rapture, whatever. The problem is you're taking a bunch of other scriptures out of context, and you're ignoring even more. And I had one person say, "Please do tell." And so I showed him. And I told them, I said, if you look at these and look at what they're describing, they're describing a completely different scenario. And if you went through the whole list, these are in conjunction with the scriptures you shared. The scriptures you shared are speaking of a different group of people. And one person, only one person, actually came back and said, you know what, I can see where you'd get the pre-trib rapture from. He goes, but you know, I'm going to hold on to my belief for now until I see more proof from this. I hope, I've never seen that or heard from that person again. I hope that they've seen the light. Because when you look at all the scripture that pertains to it, and it's not just those scriptures, but the examples. I had to watch that video. <laughs> um, the examples given in the Bible. The big thing that people go on for mid or post trip, mainly post trip, is that um, a scripture that talks about, you know, we will we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven except through uh, great tribulation. And I keep reminding them that's not talking about the great tribulation. What you have to remember is that there is a wrath associated and we are not appointed to wrath, which is scripture. So if we're not appointed to wrath and that seven year tribulation is God's wrath, we're not going to be there for that seven year tribulation. It's not going to happen. All the scriptures have to come together. You can't say, well, this scripture tells the truth, but these other scriptures don't agree with it, but I'm going to ignore those scriptures. You have to take all those scriptures into account. So you must formulate your belief based on all of the understanding, not just a little bit. And then when you go back in the past, people that obeyed, what happened to them? They were removed. Lot obeyed, got removed before the destruction. Enoch got removed. Elijah got removed. You, you see the examples of what happened. You see the representations in the Old Testament of, of the people who obeyed and did what they were supposed to do and were removed before the wrath was poured out. And those events were specifically listed as the wrath of God. So if we have examples in Scripture that talk about this, why is there a confusion? And I have a theory on that. There are people that have become Christians that have not had to endure hardships. They've not had to endure problems or mocking or scoffing. They've not, you know, it, they can sit and think about all the great things in their lives. Whereas other people, um, I'm one of those people, can sit there and not think or try to think of a day where they haven't been mocked or scoffed or made fun of or, or something. And can, can hardly even think of any days. Their whole life was in, in, endured in these tribulations. Almost every conversation I've had, there's been mocking. When it's about Christ. Especially when it's about Christ. Even from other Christians. And it's... I think it may be a way of them thinking they're going to get redemption. Well, since I didn't suffer in this life, I'm going to suffer doing this. So they make their belief to be that. Not taking all the scriptures ooh, excuse me, into account. Not looking at the evidence. This is why I don't get into long, drawn-out conversations and debates with people. Because they're, they're so hard set on their belief that they won't look at any evidence. I've had people give me evidence. I look at it. They give me scripture. I look at it. And I tell them, I've covered these scriptures. And I go in and I'll pick two or three and tell them, so now you take these in the context 
you see that there's a different meaning and they don't apply in this conversation. <clears throat> they don't like that. They get mad. People don't like their beliefs challenged. So maybe for some reason these people have led good lives and everything's been good in their life and they've not had to suffer or struggle. They think that that martyring, being martyred, is going to be a way for them to justify the things that they do. Well, I'm going to go get martyred and that's going to take care of No, the Lord's already picked who's going to get martyred. And it's not every Christian. If that was the case, then every single Christian that's, that's ever lived in the last 2,000 years would have been martyred. They haven't. The Bible says very specifically in the scriptures, God has appointed certain people to be martyrs. He's appointed other people to be this. He's appointed other people to be this. All things work for the glory of God and for the good of those that he loves. So you have to take all the scripture into account. Now, the one key thing involving the rapture Excuse me, I need a drink of water. <clears throat> the one key thing involving the rapture that everybody misses that has that, that other belief is the blessed hope. And I've had people ask me, where is that in the Bible? I show them the scripture. This is our blessed hope. They're like, well, what does that mean? I'm like, that means that you have a hope to escape the things to come. See, we know about those things. A lot of people ask, why Why is this in here and why does this pertain to us? Because you're supposed to know about that. It's supposed to terrify you. It's supposed to be incentive for you to figure it out and walk in a way circumspect with the Lord. It's supposed to inspire you to pray. But I take them through and I show them in Thessalonians. What he's describing is the rapture of the church and that it's a blessed hope. We're supposed to comfort each other with the words of the Lord's coming to get us. He's going to take us out of here. That's what those scriptures are talking about. And I tell them, when you ignore those scriptures, you now make it so there's people that believe in a pre trib rapture. And they're like, okay, so my blessed hope is to go through the tribulation? No, that doesn't make sense. So then what they do is they go into this attack mode. Well, you guys just aren't worthy. You're not ready to, to uh, die for Christ. Oh, well, now we get the understanding of where you're getting this from. You think in order to be worthy of Christ, you have to die. Again, why didn't all the other apostles die? You know, John didn't die, right? By martyrdom. John died of old, old age. It's easy to look up. You know, when we take these scriptures and we manipulate them, trying to make an understanding for ourselves, trying to twist the words to match what we want them to mean so we can justify what we're doing or justify who we are, we make the most incredibly bad mistake. Because the hope and the glory and the peace and the blessing contained within the scriptures is completely negated when we do that. The glory of the scriptures and the glory of the pre-tribulation rapture is that there is hope to escape what's coming. Now, I'm under the belief, per scripture, that there's not every Christian is going to be taken. And this is because of little details I see in the scriptures. Could I be wrong? Sure. <clears throat> but that's what I see in those in those things. I'm not going to use that to condemn other people because I don't know who's going to be here and who isn't. I don't know even know who's going. It's not my call. I'm not going to stand here and say, I know that I'm going. I, I can stand here and tell you I know that I'm saved because the the evidence and the, the qualifications and the, and the markers that are contained in the Bible, I have. And I see this in many other people. But... I can't sit here and say, yep, you're going in the rapture. I don't know. Because I don't know all of God's plan. It's not for me to know. It's a mystery he hangs on to himself. Scripture says that. But we have a hope. And that's the goal of these scriptures. We have a hope to go and to stand before God. We have a hope to be taken from these things and not have to endure these things. We have a hope it's a glorious hope. It's a blessed hope to not have to suffer through this tribulation. 
And when we look at Scripture, Scripture supports that quite clearly. So you, when you hear somebody talk about that, it's not a salvation issue, but you've got to wonder where, where their theology is coming from and where else they've done this. Because it takes all the hope away. It takes the love of the, of the deliverance away. you got to remember that there is no rapture at the end of the tribulation, for those that are in Christ anyway. Christ will be here on the earth. Where are you getting rapture to? Well, but it says he's going to call them from the four corners of heaven and the four corners of the earth. Right. To where? See, I, I showed this to a guy once. He, he told me that. I said, okay, but where are they getting taken to? Well, they're all, everybody's getting called together uh, to meet the Lord. But where's Jesus? I told him, I said, read the scriptures closer. Where's Jesus at when that call happens? He's in Jerusalem. And everybody's being called to the throne. See, little details like that people miss. They read past them because they're too busy trying to find scripture they can use as ammunition against other scripture, other um, Christians. How how does that how is that justified by the word? It's not. So, here's my whole thing on this. If you believe in a post-trib rapture, awesome. That's your belief. If you believe in a mid-trib rapture, awesome. That's your belief. If you believe in a pre-trib rapture, awesome. That's your belief. No one belief is better than another except, <laughs> except the pre-trib rapture has the most scripture supporting it than the other two understandings. And the pre-trib rapture matches what God has been doing for thousands of years. Who was taken up and, and removed after the flood? No one. Who was taken up and removed after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? No one. Nobody was taken out in the middle of those events either. These are our events, our, our tribulation events. These are our wrath events. Both of those events, that's, I'm just using those two as example, both of those events are declared as the wrath of God. Little details like that tell us the story. So, to anyone else, I'm firmly convinced it's a pre-tribulation rapture. I'm watching for it. Because the love of his appearing, which there's a crown for those who lo are loving his appearing, there's a crown for that. Well, if there's you're you, you're not watching for it at the other end, there's no crown. There's a crown for this thing, and it's because you were loving and watching and waiting and hoping, and yearning for that appearance of our Lord, to come and to remove us so we can be with Him, so we don't like this world. I've been watching the J.D. Frock's stuff the last couple of days. He said it right: the Lord shaking things up to make us hate this here and want to leave. So we don't won't want to be here. The worse it gets here for us before the tribulation, the quicker we'll want to get out of here. That way we don't end up like Lot's wife and look back. Now, <clears throat> can there be more suffering for us? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, certainly. Most definitely. And we may endure more. However, I don't know because the Bible doesn't talk about that. See, that's another interesting detail. The Bible doesn't talk about what we're going to go through before we're removed. It just says, this is what's going to be happening in the world. If you see these things, then you know it's about time to go. There's no time in history that we've had this much stuff happening. You can literally look at every end-time Bible prophecy and see it manifesting right now in the world. This is it. This is our time. This matches scripture. What does that tell us? That there's a very great and amazing event about to happen. And this event, ironically, is the kickoff to the wrath of God. God said, I will not pour my wrath out on the earth until the appointed time. It also says that there's a restrainer holding back. Now, I love what who was it that said it? I think it was JD that said it. It may have been somebody else. I love what they said. They, they said, are we holding back evil or are we holding back God? 
Is the restrainer restraining evil from doing more? Or is the restrainer restraining God from pouring out his wrath? Uh, to me, both. We're still here. The restrainer has to be removed. Now, of course, you get into all kinds of other discussions with people about how they, he's just going to take the Holy Spirit. We're all still going to be left here. No, if he took the Holy Spirit, then that would mean he took your salvation away. Because it says elsewhere in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is your seal of salvation. Your seal for the day of redemption. He's not going to remove it. That doesn't make sense and doesn't match scripture. So if you run into people with this debate, choose your arguments and your battles carefully. And if you do decide to get into that discussion with them, have your scripture ready and know what you're talking about. Remind them, what's the where's the blessed hope in having to go through the entire tribulation and maybe, maybe, hopefully, slim chance, surviving to the end to be raptured. Not everybody's going to survive to the end. Of the almost 8 billion people that are on this earth today, a ha half of them or more are going to die. They're going to be killed by disasters, by animals, by wars, by all kinds of stuff. Diseases, you name it. Starvation. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be easy. And no one's just going to go hide in a bunker somewhere. It's not going to happen. That great earthquake's going to destroy everything. All y'all's bunkers, they're going to get collapsed. See, this is where people put their trust in the world. They put their trust in the things. A lot of Christians are doing that. Well, I'm going to cover myself just in case. Just in case what? Well, just in case the pre-trib rapture is wrong. Well, then you have no faith. Why are, you, why are you questioning that? Do you have faith in it? Don't say you believe it if you don't. If you're filling your house with stuff and filling your garages with stuff, I see it every day. People putting videos up showing all this stuff that they have. That, well, that's great. Now, now we know where to go to get the stuff. Now we know whose house to go to. That's awesome. So does all your neighbors. But where's that going to go if you're taken in the rapture? People think they're going to they're going to hunker down and think their survival skills are going to help them. No. You might be able to use them here and there, but they're not. So, so to come up with that theory like that, it, it just it doesn't match the Bible. What matches the Bible is that the Lord is going to show us great mercy and love and deliver us out of this situation. And those that are going to go through this situation are going to have to come to terms with what's going on. They're going to have to come to terms with the mistake that they made and repent repent and turn back to him this is the word for the day from now on is repent turn from your life of sin turn from your understanding and turn to god the scriptures say i tell you and i tell everyone repent reconsider change your mind Stop thinking worldly and start thinking spiritually. Turn to me. I will help you. I will give you rest. I will give you strength. That's what he's saying to us. But if we're, if we're doing the things exactly the opposite of what he says, what good is that? Did the apostles and the disciples fill their houses with stuff when they were watching for the rapture, oh, the tribulation, because they thought the tribulation was about to happen. Most of them thought it did happen in 70 AD. <coughs> did they fill their houses up with stuff? No, the Bible doesn't record any of that. In fact, it says they got rid of most of their stuff. We have to be sober-minded about this. And this has been the big thing that I've been going through with the Lord, is being sober-minded about everything. Being down to earth, being rooted and grounded in real truth. And looking at it from a perspective of 
what is the absolute right thing to do in God's eyes in this situation, and then operating that way. But as is man's way, and every single Christian that has ever lived on this earth, every single believer that has ever lived on this earth, every single godly person that has ever lived on this earth, will tell you, as is our way, we try to do it ourselves, and we make a mistake, and then he's there to pick us up. Let's not do it our way. Let's do it his way. Where is his way? Contained within this word. That's what we trust in. This morning, guys, we're going to pray Psalm 48, the glory of God in Zion. And the glory of God is everything. This is what we're watching for. This is what we're yearning for. This is what we're praying for, is the glory of God. Because when God is glorified, everything is better. And this morning, we're going to glorify our God. We're going to give praise, and we're going to give thanks, and we're going to elevate him up as our God. Father, we come before you this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, to give you praise, honor, and glory. To lift you up, to lift up your holy name. And sing praises to it, shower it with praises and blessings, and give thanks. For the most amazing grace, and the most amazing peace, and the most amazing insights, and the work that you are doing today, in the world, in the body. Father, you are, I know you're watching all these debates, and I know you're watching all these... Uh, and there's all this infighting and all this constant strife and struggle. And you've been pulling me back away from that, pulling me out of those things. Don't argue with those people. It's not going to do you any good. And I see it quite clearly. Don't. It's not going to help. They're not going to listen. And the one thing that you told me, and I found it in your word, is I've already decided who's going to do what. You don't have to worry about anything. Just do what I tell you to do. And I found it in your word multiple times. You, it's already been decided. It is finished. That's what you said when you created all things. It is finished. There's nothing else left to do. And then Jesus came and he did his work on the cross. His last words, it is finished. There's nothing else left to do. Yet so many of us get these ideas in their head that there's still more that needs to be done. And it's already been done. The last thing is the tribulation. And that's a different event. And we're waiting for that event to start. Nay, we are waiting for you to deliver us from that event. And we know you're going to per your word. Father, I've asked you over and over again, what did we miss? Did I miss something? Is there any scripture we missed? Is there any understanding that we missed? Because I don't want my truth. I want your truth. And what you show me every single time of the... 30 times that I've asked this, every single time, I'm coming to get you. Watch for me. So I believe your word. If that's what your word says, I believe it. And I don't take what man says for granted. And I pray none of my brothers and sisters take what man says for granted. They need to go, need to go in your word and read your word. They need to be in prayer and fellowship with you so that you will give them the same understanding. It's, this isn't something that's special. And this is what I'm trying to get across to everybody, Father, is that there's no special understanding for individual people. We all have access to it. Every one of us. You don't, you don't hold back from anybody. But we can see clearly there's a lot of people who want to be special. And they self-elevate. And they say, I have a special word from the Lord. No. No, you don't. We all have it. Father, I pray that you settle it in our hearts. That your word is free to anyone. Your salvation is free to anyone. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding is free to all who ask. And you pour it out without measure because you want to bless us. But it's up to us to come to you for those things. It's up to us to make an effort. You're not going to just going to come find us and say, oh, hey, I'm going to give you this. We have to have this genuine desire for these things. And I pray that you put it and settle it in everybody's heart. There may be more problems that come. A lot of people are struggling with this stuff. There may be more problems that come. We may have to suffer a little bit. But that 
According to your word, we are not destined to wrath. We will not be here when you pour your wrath out on this planet. It's not meant for us. Why would we get punished for something that we don't have any part in? You said in your word, the tribulation is for me to return my attention to Israel and to punish the unbeliever. Why? Because they decided not to believe. Father, I believe your word. I want more of your word. I want more of your understanding. I want more of this truth so that I can share it with anyone I possibly can. So that I can help people understand. you. What you've done in this ministry has been amazing. Because not only have you taught me so much and led me to an amazing place of peace. But you have taught so many other people through this. You've helped them see your word in a different light. You've helped them understand the, the simple clarity contained within your word. You've helped them reestablish their relationship with you. And not just my ministry, but so many others out there that hardly have any subscribers, that hardly have any followers, that hardly have anybody listening. But the ones that really want it, you led them there to get that message. And that message was the one they needed to hear and was a blessing to them. Thank you, Father, for your amazing love and patience with us and grace and peace. Thank you for your incredible salvation. We can't give thanks enough for this because of the, just such, we look at the world and we compare the world and what it has to offer and you and what you have to offer. It's, there's no decision. It's immediately, um, guys, I'm going this way. And we turn, we change our mind. We change our path. We change our decision. We reconsider and go towards you. Except that most people see it. They know it's beautiful. And they know it's wonderful. And they know it's better. Yet they still hang on to what they're at. They still go back to the trough. When a fisherman is out on the water, any fisherman know what I'm talking about, and you see, uh, you're fishing in a spot, and you see a better spot. The water looks better. The, the, the way the water is peeling off from the, because of the wind. If you're in the ocean, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Stall islands and the, and the water is pulling off the back end. And you know the fish are sitting there because that's where all the bait is going to be. I'm going to go to that better spot because the fishing is better there. I can see the fish. I'm going there. You go there and it's the best day fishing you ever had. But so many people are like, nope, I got my spot. I'm not moving because I don't want to lose my spot. I don't want to have to wade to get there. It's, it's, it's staggering, Father, to see what people are doing. It's, it's almost, it, it's disturbing. And it's disheartening to see people get handed a plate with the most wonderful meal on it, but they sit there with their bowl of ramen and say, oh, this is good enough. It's cold ramen, and it's congealed. And they're sitting there cutting it with a butter knife, eating chunks of it because it's all stuck together. And you bring us this amazing spiritual meal and we turn away from it why do we keep doing that when we have all of history to fall back on and look at it, we have this entire bible which the people of old didn't have even with all that man still turns his head Father, I'm sorry that we're so hard-headed. I'm sorry that we're so we're so stuck in our ways. But you're you're not a stranger to that. You've been dealing with that with the Jewish people for a thousand years. They're stiff-necked people. So this isn't a surprise to you, but thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for having mercy on us. Because if it wasn't for you showing us this love and blessing, and if it wasn't for you sending Christ to die for us and pay our sin debt so that we could have salvation, we would have nothing. Thank you, Father. Psalm 48, the glory of God in Zion. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth. 
is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the great, the city of the great king. God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. For behold, the kings assembled. They passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled. They hastened away. Fear took hold of them there, and pain, as of a woman in birth pangs, as when you break the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. As we have heard, so we have seen in the cities, a city of our Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Selah. We have thought, O God, on your loving kindness in the midst of your temple, according to your name, O God. So is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. <clears throat> Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion and go all around her. Count her towers. Mark well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces that you may tell it to the generation following. For this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death. Father, you are watching every one of us. You are following every life and where it's going. Every step is being counted. You are paying attention to every decision. The intimacy with which you know us knows no bounds. We can't even comprehend it. You are watching. You are leading us. You are gently pushing us the right direction. Father, I pray we all feel it. See it. Focus on your will for us and answer the call that is on each of our lives. Respond to your word, to what you are doing. And turn toward you and look up and pay attention and see the glory and reach for that and let go of this world and leave it behind. Come Lord Jesus, we are watching for you. Father, we pray we are found worthy to be taken. We pray that we are ready. We pray that we are here looking, watching. Our hearts are prepared. Our paths are set. And they are all leading to you. So that when he does come, we can go and stand before you in heaven. These problems that are coming up, these persecutions that are coming up, I, me personally, I welcome them. Because I know that it is separating me even more from this world. And I don't want to be attached to this world. I want to be attached to you. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for the amazing, amazing salvation you have given each and every one of us. Lead us into the light. Give us strength to fight temptation. And to run from sin. And to run towards you. And to glorify you, praise you, and give thanks to you every single day for everything. For all good things come from you. And all things that seem to be bad, you turn into things that work out for our good and for your glory. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you guys for joining me for morning prayer. Whoa, hit the water hard this morning. Um... Give thanks, guys. Count your blessings. Be at peace. Stand with him. Stand in this word. This world holds nothing to you. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy to get hung up in it. I know. It happens to me. But the overwhelming thought in the true born-again believer is Christ, is God, is peace, is the Lord, is what's coming. And... Right now, he's saying, all right, y'all, repent, turn before I get there, change your mind, turn back to me, leave that world alone, ignore that world. He says, I know you have to live. I know that there's things you have to do. I got it. I'm the one that gave you those things. But don't make that your focus. Make me your focus. He says, all of a sudden, I'm just going to take you. 
and you'll be with me in paradise forever. You'll stand before me. Are you ready to stand before him? Are you looking inward? Are you analyzing yourself? Are you comparing your life to his word and what it says and changing? Repent, reconsider, turn away, change your mind. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. I'm sorry, not Jesus' name. It is in Jesus' name I bless you all. <laughs> so, excuse me. Thought it was in prayer mode. Mm -mm. It is in Jesus' name that I bless you all and pray you all see this. And go to this word for everything. And go to him in prayer for everything. You will love the reaction you get from our Father in heaven. And the peace. Oh, the peace. Don't let don't get me started on the peace. Oof. It is awesome. I love you guys very much. I pray you guys have a fantastic Monday. Keep watching. Keep looking. And be ready. If somebody comes up and says something, tell them, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Or somebody comes up and says, hey, aren't you a Christian? No, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, isn't that a Christian? Well, it depends on your definition of Christian. But I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And when they mock you, just smile. Smile and say thank you and turn around. Walk away. They're trying to get a reaction out of us. Don't give them the reaction. Love you guys very much. I thank you all for staying here and watching the videos. I'm trying to get more content out there, but it's been rough around here the last couple weeks, especially with my truck broken down. I'm trying to fight with that thing. But I will definitely see you guys in the next video. Keep your hope alive. Keep watching. And again, settle it in your hearts that when you wake up, any morning you wake up <clears throat> and everything could be different. Our world could be different or we may be standing with our Lord in heaven. Never know. What a wonderful way to wake up. See you guys in the next video.